Postcards from Nebraska on RFD-TV, a program about rural life. This week, join Roger Welsh for a canoe trip down the Middle Loop River. It's not fast, it's not exciting, just plenty of peaceful time with nature. They are the castles of the plains and the cathedrals of the prairie. It's a romantic look at Nebraska's grain elevators. After months of hard work in the fields, the changing seasons signal the time for an American tradition, the county fair. And finally, he was a POW in a labor camp on a Nebraska farm. And when the war ended, he stayed and called Nebraska home. It's all this week on Postcards from Nebraska. You've seen the films of whitewater rafters, canoers, and kayakers negotiating crashing waterfalls and rapids. The spray, the foam, rocks, cliffs. Water crashes and washes over logs and boulders. Everything is tumult and chaos. Personally, I'm drawn to another sort of canoeing. This seems to me to be more in keeping with the spirit of the gentle and quiet plains landscape. It's not a wild river, but a mild river. Sure, you can challenge wild rivers on the plains, even in Nebraska, but spray, rapids, and waterfalls aren't really what the plains are all about. This is the plains, quiet, languid water, peace and quiet, pools of catfish as big as a small child. Here, on the Middle Loop River near Danabrog, not dashing frantically back and forth from one bank to the other, but perfectly content to slip calmly along between its two tree-lined, grass-lined shores. Plains rivers are the sort of place where children can play safely, where splashing in the shallows is much more important than battling the surf. This isn't a river in which you have to wear safety clothing, helmets, or pads. This is a wading river. Lauren Isley, Nebraska's great anthropologist poet, described this exercise as sliding down the great slope of the continent, traveling along much the same as all the sediments of a million years have traveled. What goes up must come down. Clashes of tectonic plates and volcanic explosions pushed these minerals up from the crust of the earth millions of years ago. The power of the sun drew this water up somewhere over the Pacific Ocean a few years ago, dropped it onto the spongy sands of the Nebraska sand hills, and now this sand and water are on their way down, down to the Gulf of Mexico. Herman Hesse's Siddhartha said, the river is forever. And in most places, the river probably is forever. But Wright Morris, a Nebraska author like Isley, said that here on the plains, the rivers run sand. Here on the plains, the rivers are not really forever. They're in reality most of the time, only for some times. The pioneers used to say that Plains rivers were peculiar and that they ran upside down. Sand on the top, water on the bottom. To them, the rivers seemed pretty useless since they couldn't harness the water for mills or use it for transport. The white man has been farming here only a century or so, but wildlife has been getting used to Plains rivers for millennia. The critters understand the warm, dry puddles and the great stretches of white sand. They like it. The fish have learned how to seek out those deep, cool pools when the rivers run dry, and the birds know that there are feasts in those shallows. When the river is down like this, buffalo bones turn up now and then. 
Okay, this isn't as exciting as churning rapids and crashing waterfalls, but there is solace in this quiet that can be calming and satisfying too. I think that there is as much permanence in this sand, even though its individual grains constantly shift, as there is in the rocks of the Grand Canyons of this nation. Maybe Herman Hesse and Wright Morris should have gotten together. Maybe it's the rivers that run sand that are forever. Monuments. On the plains, our frontier homes were built of sod and logs. Our plains churches are not the sort of monuments that are likely to inspire awe, except insofar as we're surprised that some of them have lasted as long as they have. None of them are going to leave impressive ruins after we're gone. So where are our castles, cathedrals, monuments, and guild houses? Where is our Tintern Abbey, our Rhine castles, our Stonehenges? There they are. Grain elevators, so much a part of every plains town, large or small, that those of us who live here almost forget to notice them. In villages where two-story buildings are rare, these great towers of harvest dwarf everything around them, stabbing a hundred feet into the air, where everything else seems to prefer the horizontal. These imposing structures are called elevators because grain is dumped into their receiving pits and then lifted high to the tops of the tubes and dropped into them, where it is stored until it is needed when prices are higher, when transportation is available to take the corn and wheat and milo and beans to mills or cattle yards or ships on their way to cut the foreign trade deficit. It's not so hard to imagine them as medieval keeps with knights and ladies safe inside. Jousting mounts graze outside. The common people build their homes at the foot of the fortress walls as close as possible to the sanctuary where they can flee when the vandals approach. With a little fog and a lot of romance, it's easy to hear the clash of swords and the yells of opposing armies at the castle walls. Some elevators are made of tile, some of sheet metal. But my favorites, the only ones I think of when I think of green elevators actually, are those of concrete. Some are only one or two tubes. Others stretch a thousand yards like the walls of forbidden cities. Their reinforced concrete walls are surprisingly thin, six or eight inches, but they are by far the most striking and most enduring man-made landmarks we have out here. When I talk with my farmer friends like that, they think I'm being pretty silly. These are just grain elevators, after all. Every town has one, and each one looks pretty much like the others. Well, I tell my skeptical friends, the same thing could be said about castles and cathedrals. But when I make that argument, architectural historians tend to sniff that grain elevators are the products of neither distinguished architectural genius or long-standing architectural tradition. They're starkly utilitarian, with little concession to aesthetics. They're visited by farmers, never kings or bishops. I believe our grand architecture should be visited, as befits democracy, by farmers. As far as I'm concerned, that clinches the argument. In America, these are our cathedrals of plenty, concrete prayers of gratitude, fortresses of food, monuments to agriculture's risks and triumphs. Castles and cathedrals are places where the treasures are protected, hidden away and hoarded by the elite, only to be squandered in lavish demonstrations of the power of man and governments. Castles and cathedrals are exercises in pride. Not so grain elevators. 
Grain elevators are where the real power is commemorated and celebrated, that of the land and the people and the gods. Of course, they're simple and utilitarian. That's part of the celebration and part of the reason that these simple, utilitarian American buildings are so beautiful. Americans, Labor Day marks the end of the summer and the beginning of autumn. But for those of us on the rural plains, the changing of the seasons is marked by the county fair. Here at the Howard County Fair, not far from my home in Dannebrog, folks come to take in the rides and the attractions on the Midway, to look over the livestock and the produce, and well, to celebrate the end of a long, hard season in the fields. There are practical reasons for a county fair. An opportunity to look over new agricultural equipment and ideas, for example. This is class six, when it takes away 260 to 269 pounds. Or the chance to compete in an open contest to see who has the fattest hogs, <laughs> the strongest calves, or the handsomest sheep. But I don't find those rationale very convincing. The machinery could be examined more carefully, more closely at the implement dealer's lot just down the highway from here. Okay, our champion was Brandon Moore Lee with fan number eight. As for the competitive dimensions of a county fair, the best hog at the county fair, the winner of the purple ribbon, carries with it a prize of four dollars. The award for the county's best dairy cow is six dollars. How long have you been doing it now? Um, about seven years, I guess, since I was eight, and that's when I started forage. For Jessica Wissing of St. Labore, Nebraska, the prize today is not cash, but success in the show ring. Yeah, you I hope that there's a purple ribbon in I this I hope one? there is, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having one, but yeah. What do you do with the ribbons when you win them? Toss them in a drawer or hang them on the wall? No, I, I have a great, I have a shoe box full of all these ribbons I've gotten throughout the years. Just keep them. I don't think I've ever had a haircut that good. I mean, <laughs> that's about the best groomed critter I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Jessica exhibits the sheep she's worked with all summer, but she also competes for a showmanship award, a contest in which her movements and appearance are as important to the judge as those of her livestock. Sure, there's the pride of winning a purple ribbon and a trophy, but the fact of the matter is it's pretty hard not to get a ribbon at the county fair. But it isn't the ribbons that count here, or the cash awards. <laughs> the spirit at a county fair is celebration. The time to relax a little because the calves and crops and children have survived the summer and are ready for winter. A county fair is a celebration of harvest. The time when farmers can let down their guard for a moment and demonstrate just a little pride, laughter and relief to rejoice just a little at the increasing promise of success. <laughs> Here in the main arena of our county fair, there are car races, a tractor pull, country western music show, and inevitably, a demolition derby. Not in the big cities of Lincoln or Omaha, mind you, but right here in Howard County. And I'm sure that's part of the attraction of it. Carnival rides in Midway are run by a commercial amusement company, but there's plenty of homemade fun, too. I've always wondered who gets the most fun out of the Lutheran Church's dunking stool. Other kids from the Lutheran Church or those from the Catholic Church around the corner. Oh, yeah! 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 
just off the Midway, there's free watermelon from the local bank. Our host tonight for the watermelon feed down here in the west end of the Midway is Sherman County Bank. When was the last time your bank gave away something free? And get down there and have a good piece of watermelon any time between 5 and 8. When we come to the Howard County Fair, I'm grateful for the good food and good friends. I enjoy the rides, and I like to look over what my farmer neighbors have done with their summer. But most of all, I like to watch the children. Because if county fair time signals the end of a hard summer's work for their parents, it's also the last gasp of freedom for them before the school year starts again. Dad, can you go get a parker over there? For Jessica Wissing, it's also a time of reward for her year of lonely work, preparing her animals for competition. The end of a season for livestock and youngsters alike. When school start for you? Uh, Thursday. Will it be a relief or an agony now that you'll be through with this and back to school? Kind of an agony. The summer's gone. <laughs> the summer's gone. Yeah. 40% of the program guide for the Howard County Fair reads, for some all-American fun, Come to the Howard County Fair. Fun for the whole family. And for once, that's advertising you can believe. Just ask Jessica Wissing. She gets a lot out of her lamb. The lamb's got excellent control. The lamb is clean. Now this second place show me next this year. <laughs> Congratulations, that's terrific. Did you really suspect you were going to get it? Well, I knew I had a chance. Yeah. But I didn't know for sure. I never pretty exciting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Congrats. Right in the back of you, there was a headquarters where the Americans stayed, where the office was, and this was the PX building. The rolling wooded hills of southeastern Nebraska seem an unlikely setting for a prisoner of war camp. The whole place was fenced. You couldn't get out. There was a big gate here, and there was probably a guard standing there, and uh, some other guards were patrolling the fence line. This undistinguished home in Weeping Water was once the center of a camp housing 250 prisoners during the Second World War. Uh, I cannot recall a single incident where there was trouble with the farmers. Bill Oberdick came to this country as an unwilling guest. He was a 22-year-old German soldier captured in North Africa and brought here as a prisoner of war. I don't think anybody made ever any attempt to escape here. Huh. Hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war worked in America's agricultural fields during the war, and the plains were a favorite location. The farmers needed help. And as Bill Oberdick himself says, escape was not likely because you could run for three days and still not be anywhere. They needed one replacement for a sick guy here in Weeping Water, and this was a labor camp. You were here only to work someplace. I was the only one that volunteered and said, I have never been in Weeping Water. Let's go. So I wound up here. <laughs> Life in the orchards around Nebraska City during the harvest season was certainly more interesting than the crushing boredom of the internment camp. I worked only one, one season, and that was picking cherries for kimmels and apples for kimmels. Despite his unusual circumstances, Bill observed what was going on around him. The wealth of America, the richness of the soil, the serenity of Richard Kimmel's orchards and the warmth of Plains farmers, even toward an enemy. Can you remember the first time you saw him, what impressed you about him? Well, he seemed to be interested in the work and uh, he was just a nice person to be around. Did it bother yeah. you at all that you had German prisoners of war here in the orchard? No. Not at all. No, no problem with that. I like the outdoors. I, I was from an office, and I didn't care much for the office. I like the big blue sky and 
the green stuff. Because he was a non-commissioned officer and fluent in four languages, he was put in charge of the other prisoners at the Weeping Water labor camp. Did you hear the news about how things the, were going in Europe? The fellows usually bought a paper home from some farmer that, that would uh, get the New York Times or something like that. And uh, we always knew what was going on. You heard the news then about VE Day. Yeah. Uh, the Americans, uh, they felt like celebrating that the war was over. And this Captain Junovich, he approached me and he said, uh, would you get along without guards tonight? And uh, my boys, they would like to celebrate. So we went, uh, I told him, go ahead, let them celebrate. And here for that night when after Germanist defeat or surrender, there were no guards around here. They were all living it up downtown. <laughs> But nobody knew except Captain Junovich uh, and me. I wonder how many people drive by here without having any idea what that little white building really is. Well, I have no uh, attachment. I'm not sorry or happy or anything. It's just one of those things. You came, you lived here for a while, and that was it. But it certainly did change your life. Yeah, it did. I never figured I would come back to the United States. And uh, here I am again. After the war, Bill Oberdick returned as a free man to work in this orchard in Nebraska City, the heart of Nebraska's apple country, precisely where he had labored as a prisoner for Richard Kimmel. Did you sense that anyone here in Nebraska City uh, wondered what was going on, that you were bringing back a German prisoner of war? Was there any resentment at all? I never felt any resentment at all, no. It could have been, I don't know, but uh, it was never evident as far as I knew. Paradoxically, it's been the turmoil of war that has brought many settlers here to the peace of the plains. My own grandparents came here from Russia to escape war. The Danish ancestors of my friends and neighbors in Danabrog came here to get away from wars. And still today, refugees of war come here from Southeastern Asia and Central America. Bill Oberdick's family now manages the orchard, but he is an active 70-year-old, working at the cider press, supervising the work in the orchard, enjoying the sight, sounds, and smells of harvest. We have about 5,000 apple trees, and at this time of year, we pick those apples. The hand Although they started a world apart and are still separated by a generation, Richard Kimmel and Bill Oberdick seem more like father and son than captor and prisoner. No, yeah, that's lethal. And uh, I know, I know that one of your daughters is named Ricarda. Is that right? Mm -hmm. After Mr. Kimmel. Mr. Kimmel. And another daughter is named Lorraine, after Mrs. Kimmel. That certainly is a sign of the kind of respect you must have for him. Well, we have them in the highest respect. They have been very kind to us. You have to come to class again tomorrow. When Mr. Kimmel retired in 1964, Bill Oberdick bought the very orchard in which he had once worked as a prisoner. Talk about a silver lining. They don't talk about rain at all for the next few weeks. All nice weather, dry weather. Mm -hmm.